They suffered through COVID-19 in the U.S. and still don't want the vaccine. Hello and welcome to the I Am A World channel. I uh, meant to cover this last week, but in a awful botched recording that I did for about an hour uh, without the microphone on, that was fun, so I put it off. But with uh, more things popping up, I need to come back to this before I can report on other things. So here we go. Washington, Bloomberg. When Eric Gruner contracted uh, COVID-19 in January, he became so ill that he struggled out of the, off the couch. One night he awoke at 3 a.m., winded, barely able to talk, and so fatigued he could hardly lift his head. I woke my wife up, he said, telling her to take, uh, telling her to take him to the emergency department. Emergency department? Who talks like that? My wife thought she was going to to be a widow. After three weeks of recovery at home, the 54-year-old Texas insurance broker experience is one few uh, would want to endure twice, but he remains unvaccinated, putting him among a stubborn contingent of Americans who say they have natural immunity and do not require shots, a belief that experts are divided on. I'm in the category of persons who at least need a, the vaccine at this point, said uh, Mr. Groomer. To me, natural antibodies are better than any man-made antibodies. He is concerned that inoculated people can still get infected and believes there is a lack of clarity about the shot's long-term safety. Even if he had not been ill, he said he probably would have remained unvaccinated. His wife and son, who appear to have avoided COVID-19, are not vaccinated either. More than 100 people, sorry, more than 100 million people in the United States have likely been infected with COVID-19, according to one recent estimate. Many of them have become proponents of natural immunity, who are among the roughly 126 million Americans who remain unvaccinated, about 38% of the population. As public health officials urge universal immunization, polling shows more resistance to shots among people with prior infections. The majority report uh, having had COVID-19 influence their decision to remain unvaccinated. The debate over natural immunity fuels hesitancy and foreshadows more challenges for vaccination campaigns as highly contagious Delta variant rages. Indeed, some research indicates that an earlier case of COVID-19 protects as well or better against the strain than vaccination alone. A recent analysis from Israel found that fully inoculated people were at six times higher risk of COVID-19 than those who were previously infected and unvaccinated. Those with earlier infections were also less likely to fall ill with symptoms and get hospitalized with COVID-19, according to the study published before review by experts in the field. But other findings suggest different conclusions. A large British study, also published before peer review, found two-dose vaccines were at least as effective as a natural immunity. Last month, a study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found people who caught COVID-19 and remained unvaccinated were more than twice as likely to be reinfected as those who got immunized. Experts also point to continuing uh, questions about how much protection is given by previous illness, how long it lasts, and how well it stacks up against vaccination. Several studies, including the one from Israel, shows at least one shot adds to the protection granted by an infection. If you've been naturally infected and you get vaccinated, you are better off, said Mr. Paul Offit, director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and there's no downside. There's no reason not to get the vaccine. No, no downside at all. Can't think of any reason why. What, what could be, what could go wrong? I mean, people don't get hurt by vaccines, especially experimental ones. That is, I mean, like nothing could have possibly go wrong. Stupid. Just get the vaccine, right? Uh, the combination of natural immunity and vaccine-induced protection has long been seen as an end route. Sorry, route out, as a route out of the pandemic. That sounded weird. In the U.S., the concept became politicized early on as opponents of masking, social distancing, and other public health measures claimed that when enough people had been infected with the coronavirus, the pandemic would burn up. I don't know. I guess kind of like 
history has shown that that's been the case every time. I could give you a whole list of pandemics that have all burned out before the vaccine guy came around. I've shown this in previous uh, uh, streams when I was doing live streaming. I don't have that ready, so I can't show you now. But anyways, antibodies and other components of the immune system uh, re remembers invaders helping protect against further infection, but immunity is complicated and not without limitations. Many infectious diseases like smallpox persisted for millennia, despite humans' natural immune response, and have been controlled only by vaccination. Yeah, no. Smallpox just got... Oh, sorry, I'm thinking of polio. I have to research smallpox that much, but... um. <laughs> I believe it's it's different because of the way it tran transmits. But um, regardless of that, they've uh, they can bring back smallpox like that with the with synthetic biology. They've been doing that. Uh, a couple scientists in Canada brought back the smallpox in an experiment. Actually, without ever had, without getting ever getting a sample or anything like that, they just created it. Just by having the proper genetic sequence, they printed it or whatever. Sorry, I'm ran off track here. The immune system can also be fooled by viral vac sorry viral tricks such as mutation. SARS-CoV-2's interaction with the body still has many mysteries that remain uncracked. We don't have any formula where we know what gives you reasonable protective immunity," said Dr. Shane Crotty, professor at. Lajola Institute for Immuno Im Immunology. We can't look at the single person and say, yes, you are protected. After illness with COVID-19, the vast majority of people appear to have significant amounts of immun immunological memory as measured by antibodies and immune, cells, immune cells, Dr. Crotty noted. But about 5% do not, and levels of protection vary dramatically between people. Then there is the issue of documenting infection. Some people who believe that so I believe they have COVID-19 were never diagnosed. Even for those who were infected, what tests do you trust? Dr. Crotty said, what antibody tests do you trust if you're going to formalize this? Meanwhile, vaccines are plentiful in the U.S. and carry on rare serious safety issues, said Brian Kestruki, president and chief executive officer of the Beaumont Foundation, which has a public health focus. The risk of COVID-19 infection far are far greater, he added. The path to getting through the pandemic is vaccination, said, he said. Most people who claim they are protected by natural immunity are not virologists. They're not public health professionals. So, I mean... Oops. Stop that. Whatever. Dr. Todd Zywicki and George Mason University... Law professor sued school officials in early August over its vaccination policy and other COVID-19 measures, saying that he should not have to comply because he already had an infection. The Civil Liberties Alliance, which represented him, later said Dr. Zywicki had been given a medical exemption, but the university does not consider natural immunity a substitute for vaccination. The group said its statement calling inoculation medically unnecessary for those people. Uh, I think that's all that really matters in this article. I'm just reading it for no good reason. I don't remember anything else being interesting down here. Oh, that's a creaky door sound. All right, so this article is very uh, key to what is coming down the pike. And I'll show this in the article after that. <laughs> These three articles really say it all. But uh, here we go. This is NPR Goats and Soda. Stories of life in a changing world. New studies find evidence of superhuman immunity to COVID-19 in some individuals. Really? How? Look at their... Uh, this looks like 3D pen doodle art. I don't really buy in this... This is, this is graphics here. Oh, my goodness. Some scientists have called it superhuman immunity, 
or bulletproof, but immunologist Shane Crotty prefers hybrid immunity. There's your hybrid language because you got to have that Khmer programming, right? And that Shane Crotty is from the previous article. Overall, hybrid immunity to SARS-CoV-2 appears to be impressively potent, Crotty wrote in commentary in, in Science back in June. No matter what you call it, this type of immunity offers much needed good news in what seems like an endlessly, endless array of bad news regarding COVID-19. Over the past several months, a series of studies... Sorry, hold on. Sorry, it's a freaking cat. He's upset that I have the door closed. Klaus. Anyways, overall, hybrid immunity to SARS-CoV-2 appears to be impressively potent, like Crotty Turd said. No matter what you call it, this type of immunity offers much need. Oh, I already read all this part. For the past several months, a series of studies have found that some people mount an extraordinary, extraordinary powerful immune response against SARS-CoV-2. Their bodies produce very high levels of antibodies, but they also make antibodies with great flexibility. Likely capable of fighting off the variants of coronavirus circling in the world, Word, world, but also likely effective against variants that may emerge in the future. One could reasonably predict that these people will be quite well protected against mo most, and perhaps of all, the SARS-CoV-2 variants that are, were are, sorry that we are likely to see in the foreseeable future," says Paul Bianazzi. Bianazzi, Paul Bianazzi. Okay virologist at the Rockefeller University who helped lead study several of the studies. And a study published online last month, Bianazzi and his colleagues found antibodies in these individuals that are, can strongly neutralize the six variants of concern tested. Got to have the six again. Including Delta and Beta, as well as several other viruses related to SARS-CoV-2, including one in bats, two in pangolins, and the one that caused the first coronavirus pandemic, SARS-CoV-1. The original. Klaus, relax. I'm trying to work here, man. Sorry. Cat's pissed off. This is being a bit more speculative, but I would also suspect that they would, be, would have some degree of protection against the SARS-like viruses that have yet to, be, to infect humans, Bionazzi says. So who is capable of mounting this superhuman or hybrid Im immune response? P people who have had a hybrid exposure to the virus. Hmm? Specifically, they were infected with COVID-19 in 2020 and then immunized with mRNA vaccines this year. Those people have amazing responses to the vaccine, says virologist Theodora Hatzazauzanau at the Rockefeller University, who also helped to lead several of the studies. I think they're in the best position to fight the virus. The antibodies in those bl people's blood can even neutralize SARS-CoV-1, the first coronavirus, which emerged, in 20, emerged 20 years ago. Actually, it was about 17 years ago, as uh, I've reported in, the, in my 17 video. That virus is very, very different from SARS-CoV-2. In fact, these antibodies could even fight off a virus engineered, ooh, kinky, on purpose to be highly resistant to neutralization. The virus contained 20 mutations that are known to present, sorry, prevent SARS-CoV-2 antibodies from binding to it, antibodies from people who were only vaccinated or only had prior COVID infections were essentially useless against this mutant vi virus, but antibodies in people with the hybrid immunity could neutralize it. These findings show how powerful the mRNA vaccines can be in people with prior exposure to SARS-CoV-2. She says, there's a lot of research now focused on finding a pan-coronavirus vaccine that would protect against all future variants. One vaccine to rule them all. Uh, I don't want it. But there's a catch, right? She adds, you first need to be sick with COVID. After natural infections, the antibodies seem to evolve and become not only more potent, but also broader. They become more resistant to mutations within the virus. And colleagues, don't know if everyone was sorry, everyone who has had COVID-19 and then an mRNA vaccine will have such a remarkable immune response. We've only studied the phenomena with 
a few patients because it's extremely laborious and difficult research to do, she says. But she suspects it's quite common. With every single one of the patients we studied, we saw the same thing. The study reports data on 14 patients. Sounds like somebody needs some funding for their study. Several other studies support their hypothesis and buttress the idea is that exposure to both the coronavirus and the mRNA vaccine triggers an exceptionally powerful immune response. In one study published last month, remember they were telling everyone not to get the shot if they've already had COVID? Boy, did they ever flip that one, hey? <laughs> I love that. The narrative is its such a fairy tale. It just goes from one end to the other. It's like, don't get the vaccine when you have the coronavirus now. Now you got to get it because it gives you super immunity. It's just, it's so ridiculous. It's laughable. Okay. New England Journal of Medicine scientists analyzed antibodies generated by people who had infected with this original SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1, back in 20, sorry, back in 2002 or 2003, then received an mRNA vaccine this year. Remarkably, these people also produced high levels of antibodies, and it's worth re reiterating this point from a few paragraphs above, antibodies that could neutralize a whole range of variants and SARS-like viruses. Now, of course, there are many remaining questions. For example, what if you catch COVID after you're vaccinated, or can a person who hasn't been infected with COVID-19 mount a super, superhuman response if they received a third dose of the vaccine as a booster? Hatsunawao says she can't answer e either of the questions yet. I'm pretty certain that that a third shot will help a person's antibodies evolve even further, and perhaps they will requ acquire some breadth, breadth of flexibility, but whether they will ever manage to get the breadth they you see following, blah, blah, blah. All right, where was I? Immunologist, sorry, immunologist. Nope, immunolog. I can't say the word. Immunologist uh, John Wary at the University of Pennsylvania is a bit more hopeful. In our research, we already ha see some of this antibody evolution. You have that evolution programming in all your news articles because directed evolution is part of the game here. That is what's going on. Part of it is directed evolution. Other part of it's well. <laughs> that understand if you get my grasp um evolution happening in people who are just vaccinated he says although it probably fa happens faster in people who have been infected in a recent study published online in late august wary and his colleagues show that over time people who have had only two doses of the vaccine and no prior infection start to make more infection more flexible antibodies antibodies that can better recognize many of the variants of concern so a third dose of the vaccine would presumably give those antibodies a boost and push the evolution of the antibodies further, where he says, so a person will be equi better equipped to fight off whatever variant the virus puts out there next. Based on all these findings, it looks like an immune system is eventually going to have the edge over the virus, says Paul Bianazzi at the Rockefeller University, and if we're lucky, SARS-CoV-2 will eventually fall into the category of viruses that give us only a mild cold. La la la. All right, so the previous article, as stated, uh, about 126 million Americans have yet to have the vaccine. And they're saying about 100 of them presumably have had COVID-19. And then this article is saying that even though they're saying that previous infection is even better with the vaccine. So, I mean, what a great way to uh, create the narrative that, oh, you'll be super immune. But that's not enough. Not that alone. Because the people will refuse. But here is where it ties in. Experts say Nipah virus has potential to be another pandemic with a higher death toll. Now I've covered, oh, so loud, I've covered Nipah virus last year in my video, um, my video called Sin, bioterrorism, and the printable pandemic. 
it uh i also covered it previous to this video in blog form in coronavirus pandemic part five there's something wicked this way comes and the video is all about um hold on it's all about um sorry i mean lack of concentration right now because of the noises that i'm hearing uh, it's it's about the bioterrorism threat that's been in the narrative this entire time uh i'm not gonna play the video yet i'll play the section after i read this article because you'll see so yeah higher toll potential for another pandemic with the nipah virus Excuse me. Experts say Nipah virus has potential to be another pandemic with a higher death toll. I hate when they just put the title in twice, and I and I read it like a like a fool, I make a fool of myself. Earlier this month, a 12-year-old boy in Karela, Kozhikode district in India died from the Nipah virus, a virus that most people probably never heard of. A virus that, according to experts, has the potential to become another global pandemic with a significantly higher death toll. Approximately 70% of people who are infected with the Nipah virus die, says Dr. Stefan Lubby, professor of infectious disease at Stanford University. When the virus first appeared in Malaysia in 1999, there's your 666 there, it killed more than 100 of the approximately 300 people that had been infected. When it emerged in Kerala in 2018, only two of the 19 people who contracted Nipah survived. Often, even survivors are left to suffer. Sorry, I don't want that video to play yet. Left to suffer. Many are left with long-term consequences, including persistent convulsions and personality changes, according to the CDC. For those reasons and others, the World Health Organization declared Nipah a virus of concern and experts are urging more research and attention. Now, this video is important because it's basically the previous article I just read, but with a little more information that will really kind of help you tie this thing together. Let's make sure the sound is up. Let's go. So they're saying that it can potentially protect against not only SARS, but other viruses, diverse viruses, whatever. Virus is currently circulating in bats and pangolins. Keep that in mind.
Oops, I almost recorded without my mic on. All right, so um, why would they have this video in the middle of a Nipah virus article? Hmm? Oh, great, it just jumped into something. Hold on. Okay. Oh, so it's jumping around. I still got my mic on. Yep, all good. Recording. All right. Nipah virus is a zoonotic virus. Mm-hmm. Similar to coronavirus, Nipah is a zoonotic virus, which means that it can spread between animals and people. Generally, transmission happens when a person consumes contaminated food or comes into direct contact with an infected animal. Now, that whole food thing is another thing to think about, too, with all the, the forecoming food shortages. There you go. Uh, fruit bats are the natural carriers of Nipah. Once Nipah spreads from an animal to a person, that person can go on to infect other humans. Though it is still uncertain, experts believe contaminated food caused the cur this current outbreak. One plausible theory is that, the, that those who have been infected in Kerala ate food or fruit contaminated with bat, saliva, or, ex or excreta. Dr. Tekunkara Sarandran Anish Please don't ever make me say that name again. Associate Professor of Community Medicine at the Government Medical College, College in Travadapuram told NPR, Nipah is not easily transmissible yet. <laughs> oh, man. The good news, if there can ever be good news when discussing a deadly virus, is that Nipah virus is not very transmissible. There are occasional Nipah super spreaders. Mm-hmm. There's your super spreaders language, who infect a lot of people, says Lubby. But the average transmission rate is less than one person per infection. Why? Because it's a highly deadly virus. I mean, the higher the death toll of the virus, the less it can travel. That's why the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2, is so so not deadly. It's a, what, supposedly 99.9% .9 survival rate. Because it's such a weak ass virus, of course, this is all going by the narrative that we want to believe the fairy tale virus to begin with. But if we're going to believe the fairy tale, that's the case. It's such a weak ass virus that it can doesn't kill people very easily, and it most people have to have comorbidities and be like ninety years old to die from it. So, according to the fairy tale, this is all fairy tale stuff. We're going to believe the fairy tale. For YouTube's, the YouTube community's sake. Okay, YouTube community, the virus is real. There you go. Happy? You can see we're currently fighting a highly contagious respiratory virus with a highly infection, infection, with a highly infection variant. That's new, sorry, news we want. However, that good news might only, mi only might be temporary. Lubby notes that each time a person is infected, the virus is in the environment that selects for human adap adaptation and transmissibility. The risk that a new strain that is more efficiently transmitted person to person could generate a devastating outbreak. As we've learned too well, viruses mutate. And when they mutate, they could spell even more trouble. So they're setting you up for the pandemic too. Basically saying, oh, this, this Nipah virus just doesn't transmit very well. Uh, Oh, it also transmits through bats, like they, like SARS CoV, because um, we love that bat symbolism because it means both death and rebirth, and because we're killing off the old world and rebirthing it to the new world order. But anyways, they're setting you up for the the next fairy tale, right? Because, um, sorry, distracted by noises. Hold on. Just, sorry. Availability of vaccines or treatments, unfortunately, we don't have yet a cure for or vaccine for Nipah virus, though there is hope on the horizon. Once again, let's take a moment to thank, to thank scientists and doctors who work tirelessly to protect us from current and potential pandemics. Alongside potential vaccine candidate, researchers are looking to a drug called M102.4, one study found that in phase one clinical trials that the drug was also able to sorry was able to neutralize Nipah. So here we go. 
we have the narrative that the if you get infected with COVID and then get the mRNA, that you have superhuman immunity that could cross over into other viruses. And then we have Nipah here that could potentially mutate and is um, also spread through bats and other animals. It's also zoonotic, also RNA virus and all this. So we have the narrative set up in these two art the three articles that I just read. There's still a bunch of Americans that don't have the vaccine but are likely to have had the COVID infection. Oh, here we go. There's some studies that are saying, or there is a study that sort of says that you could have superhuman immunity because you had both the infection and the vaccine. And then we have, oh, this virus is even deadlier. It could be a potential pandemic. It might mutate. And, oh, it doesn't have a vaccine for it. So they're just <sighs> painting up for a narrative that this other scary virus is coming out. And if you get the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, you could have some protection against it because they need to get that black goo inside you. Neutralizing the virus before it can cause damage is important, considering how troubling Nipah virus symptoms can become. Initial symptoms include fever, headache, which can last for three days or up to two weeks. After that, an infected person can expect sore throat, cough, and respiratory issues. Soon thereafter, too soon, the symptoms turn severe. Nipah can cause swelling in the brain cells, which leads to drowsiness, confusion, and potentially coma and death. The CDC notes that remdesivir, Remdesivir, also used against COVID-19, has shown some effectiveness in non-human primates when given prophylactically after exposure. So there you go, remdesivir. There was a video I uh, posted on Odyssey that you might want to check out. Of course, I tried to put a little video out on YouTube to tell people to go there, and I got a strike on my main channel. This is why I'm posting it to my secondary channel, Venomous Meet the Savage. So my main channel, I'm a werewolf, is um, it's just you know in a little timeout for a week because of that 29 second video. If Nipah goes global, the Nipah virus is seemingly under currently under control in Kerala, but experts warn we can't let down our guard. As long as there's a lot we don't know, the possibility of an epidemic can be ruled can't be ruled out, Anish says. Prevention is key, along with standard infection control measures. The CDC encourages anyone who lives in an area where Nipah outbreaks have occurred to practice good hand hygiene, avoid sick bats. Stay you can hang out with the healthy bats, just avoid those sick ones. And avoid anywhere where bats roost. Avoid consuming raw date palm syrup. And Ah, sorry for all the distractions. Anyways, where was I? Uh, avoid consuming raw date palm syrup. Avoid consuming fruit. Consuming fruit potentially contaminated, contaminated by bats and avoid contact with blood or fluids of any person infected with Nipah. Likewise, the WHO urges anyone consuming fruit or fruit products like raw date syrup to wash thoroughly and peel the fruit before consuming it in order to decrease the risk of international transmission. Also, discard any fruit with signs of bat bites. <laughs> uh, right, right now, Nipah has been identified in Malaysia during the 1999 outbreak in Bangladesh and India. As our world shrinks due to international travel and trade and a cl as climate change forces bats into new habitats, that could change. Get out of here, Batman. Stop it. We observe fruit bats here in Cambodia and in Thailand in markets, worships, areas, um, schools, and tourist locations in Angkor Wat. There is a big roost of bats there. Venetia During, uh, head of virology at the Institute, Pasteur Research Lab in Phnom, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, told the BBC's future program, in a normal year, Angkor Wat Host 2.6 million visitors. Uh, that's 2.6 million opportunities for Nipah virus to jump from bat to humans and annually in just one location, but it doesn't. From there, it's not hard to imagine one of the 
those 2.6 million opportunities hopping on an international flight and leading to another global pandemic, one that's a lot deadlier and a lot harder to treat. Now, uh, remember the movie Contagion. That is actually based off the Nipah virus, and I've reported on this before. It's not based on, you know, well, it couldn't be based on SARS, but that's the virus. It was modeled after the Nipah virus, and I believe I... So, Hen Nipah virus is a genus of negative RNA viruses in the family of Parem noxividre, order monomegalovirals, uh, containing five species, heptaviruses are naturally harbored by petorbid fruit bats, flying foxes, and microbats of several species. And Nipah viruses are characterized by long genomes in a wide host range. Their recent emergence as zoonotic pathogens capable of causing illness and death in domestic animals and humans as a cause of concern. In 2009, RNA sequence of three novel viruses in, the, in phylogenetic relationship to known hepnipa viruses were detected in African straw-colored fruit bats in Ghana. The finding of these novel hepnipa viruses outside Australia and Asia indicates that the region of potential endemicity of hepnipa viruses may be worldwide. These African hepnipa viruses are slowly being characterized. Nipah and Hendra hepnipa viruses are both considered Category C USDA HHS overlap select agents. Oh, that's not what I want to do. Stay there. No, come back. Uh, one more interesting to note. As mono, as all mononicin, mononicin viral genomes, Hendra virus, Nipah virus, virus genomes are non-segmented, single-stranded, negative sense RNA. Both genomes are 18.2 KB in length and contain six genes, this corresponding to six structural proteins. In common with members of the Paragnoxavidre family, the number of nucleotides in the Hepniva virus genome is a multiple of six, consistent with what is known as the rule of six. Deviation from the rule of six through mutation or incomplete genome synthesis leads to inefficient viral replication, probably due to structural constraints imposed by binding between the RNA and the N protein. So there's a lot of a lot of sixes involved with the Nipah virus. Interesting enough. Cause of emergence. The bridge of Nipah viruses parallels in the emergence of zoonotic viruses in recent decades, SARS coronavirus, Australian bat Lassa virus, that's rabies, uh, the Australian rabies, whatever. Uh, Menangle virus, Marburg virus, and possibly Ebola. Viruses are also hybrid by bats and are capable of infecting a variety of other species. The emergence of each of these viruses has been linked in an increase in contact between bats and humans, sometimes evolving in intermediate domestic animal host. Increased contact and driven both by human encroachment into the bat territory. In the case of Nipah, specifically pig pens in said territory, and by movements of bats towards human populations due to changes in food distribution and loss of habitat. There you go. Yep. So, let me show you. I'm going to skip this. This one's just an article about how they have a, a drug, an antiviral drug for the Hepnipah virus family. It supposedly has been shown to be successful in neutralizing the infection or whatever. It's not that exciting. So I'm going to play a clip from my video I made last year. If you don't cooperate with me. I'm still recording, right? Yep, okay. Gotta go back. I wonder if I can double tap. Can I? That would be nice. All right, so in many ways our world could end. 
of threats outlined in the book, there are one that you least worried it, are you least worried about? It's probably infectious disease, at least as it comes from nature. Scroll down. Uh, it was reported on a reporting on climate change that really got me started on this book, but I can trace it all the way back to being in Hong Kong for the SARS epidemic in 2003 and seeing the way a disease could pop out of nature and catch fire in a globalized world that was legitimately scary, especially lived through a ground zero. But it, along with other diseases I report on, like avian flu and Ebola, also taught me that nature has a kind of speed limit on disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, disease has killed more human beings than anything else, any war or natural disaster, but evolution prevents anything that comes out of nature from being both virulent and contagious enough to remotely threaten human extinction. So I'm not that worried about a virus suddenly emerging and killing us all, even among ex animal extinctions, you almost never see this. Uh, before we're contagion and pathogens can be weaponized to disseminating effect, right? Exactly, and that's very concerning. In fact, in the... In there from... Wait, what? The threat... Th sorry, the threat from bioengineered pathogens using new tools from biology like gene editing and synthetic biology is, in my view, probably the greatest existential threat over the next few decades. Uh, that's because these tools take what's already a killer in nature and can potentially allow us to bypass the limits of evolution. I have an example in this book of a kind of war game put on by the centers, Center for Health Security at Saint, Saint, sorry, at Johns Hopkins University, where an environmental terror group takes what is the common cold and splices in virulent genes from the Nipah virus, a real-life pathogen that exists in Southeast Asia and kills about 75% of the people it infects. Yes, hold on, Batman. In a mystery investigation of two Canadian scientists, a request for Ebola, have Nipah viruses from the Wuhan lab. So I, there I show the connection of the virus to the Nipah virus here. A shipment of Ebola and Hepnipah virus samples in China previously disclosed by the agency and first reported by the National Post was requested specifically by the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And then it just talks about how deadly Nipah virus is, and this is it's was the fix, fix the fictional Mer, MEV1 virus featured in 2011 contagion was largely based on the Nipah virus, just like I said. So there you go. Just hold on a minute. Okay, so if you have not seen that exercise of the Centers for Health Security. Uh, John Hopkins, not the event 201. This was Claydex that I've reported on many times. It is called Claydex. And here is uh, the news report, the fake news report, the GNN uh, of them talking about the terror group that spread the virus around. So there you go.
You can uh, watch the Claydex scenario on uh, the Centers for Health Security YouTube channel. You can watch all four parts there. You just got to scroll down their feed. But anyways, so there you go. There's the narrative. We have, again, I'll recite this. We have still a bunch of Americans that aren't yet vaccinated, but presumably have had the COVID-19 infection. Then we have a study saying, a very, very tiny study of 14 patients apparently, with superhuman immunity because they had the infection and the mRNA vaccine. And then we have new virus, not really a new virus, Nipah virus, deadly potential pandemic, could mutate, doesn't have a vaccine, but it's also a zoonotic virus and also derived from bats, even though it's the narr the narrative of the bat origin for SARS-CoV was never proven. Uh, and in fact, they switched it back over to, to um, lab theory because they were covering both bases, right? They had to do the nat natural res reservoir theory because they wanted to push the climate stuff really hard. And they did. And it's going to come back on our asses pretty soon. And then they switched it over to lab theory because they're doing that the pre-programming for you to, to to get in your head of a bioterrorism attack. So they got you thinking that this is the biovirus or the bioterror virus. The lab lab created uh, attack on Americans in the world by China. They have that narrative there and that narrative. So they just play one narrative and they play the other narrative on it because it's whatever they need to do. So that means that the virus, the bioterrorism, we're getting closer to that point. That's coming at some point. Whether it's going to be an equal freak group that wants to depopulate the Earth, like a brighter dawn, there's your sun worship symbolism there. Uh, whether it's going to be that or the, another possibility that I've seen in the building of the narrative was a right extremist group, like in like a Trumpians or, you know, the science deniers, the the anti climate change people, the 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 right, the white supremacists, the the right extremists, the vaccine deniers, whatever anti vaxxers, that narrative could be that one. It doesn't really matter. Oh, and they've also said nation states. So you have your three options here. You got your eco freaks, you got your right extremists, and you got your nation state actors. That's three potential targets, whatever they feel like they need to use, they'll use. Or it could be the rogue scientist with his 3D printers or a hacker group. You never know. It's all potential there. doesn't matter how it's done. It's something that's a matter of when, not if, from what they've been telling for the past couple of years and even longer if we look back further, like here in 2018, the Claydex scenario there. But anyways, that is pretty much all I had to say about that is look out for that. Expect them to push the vaccine even harder. Uh, now that they have some study saying that you could have superhuman superhuman uh, or hybrid immunity you could get your hybrid immunity if you get your you get your jab if you had covid already anyways that's all I had to say about that so I'm gonna wrap this up there was some other articles I want to cover but I guess I think I'll record it separately from this and I have them tied together because they're not really tied together but it was stuff that needs to be talked about. So I will catch you again later. This is Venomous reporting from the Brave New World. Stay healthy. Definitely press stop. Definitely pressed it.